Hey guys, welcome back to the Road to 528 MCAT test prep course. For our next topic, we're going to cover the concepts of stereoisomers. This video is a second in a two-part series covering isomers as a whole. Today we will focus on conformational isomers, configurational isomers, and chirality. These topics are advanced concepts that are better understood if you already understand the basic concepts of isomers. So I highly recommend watching my previous video before continuing with this one. And with that, let's begin. Now first off, let's start with conformational isomers. As I said in the last video, conformational isomers are isomers with the same molecular formula and can be converted between each other through the rotation of single bonds. These rotations can be visualized by Newman projections, which are used to show straight chain conformations. There are four types of Newman projections that you should be familiar with on test day. The anti-projection has two functional groups on the same plane, but they're on opposite sides. This is a 180 degree distance between the two groups, and it is the most energetically favorable projection of the four. Gauche projections have a 60 degree distance between their groups. Now, Gauche and anti-projections are both called staggered projections because there is no overlap between their functional groups. So I'll label this really quick as staggered. These groups are more energetically favored compared to their overlap counterparts, which are called eclipsed. To convert between these uh, from anti to gauche uh, conformations, the molecule must go through an eclipse conformation. An eclipse projection has the functional groups 120 degrees apart on opposite planes. There's another type of eclipse conformation that's called totally eclipsed, and there's complete overlap, meaning zero degree distance between the functional groups. This conformation has the highest energy state of the four, and therefore it is the least energetically favored. This is because the groups are on the same side and the same plane, therefore increasing steric strain. That's basically all you need to know about these uh, new projections for the MCAT. I'll briefly recap their uh, energetic favorability real quick. So I said uh, anti is the most favored. And I said that totally eclipse is the least favored. Gauche is second favored. And eclipse is third favored. Remember guys, highest energy state has an inverse correlation with favorability. So anti would actually have the lowest energy state of the four. Here's a chart that helps you visualize this easily. If you look closely, you can see that the highest energy potential uh, of all the conformations is totally eclipsed. This one right here. I'll label this as TE. The lowest is anti, this one right here. So I'll label that as A. The intermediate ones are eclipsed and gauche. You can see this one right here with a 60 degree uh, distance. That's going to be gauche. Same with this one. And the 120 distance is the eclipsed. So this one and this one. Screenshot, screenshot uh, chart. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Screenshot this chart and study it. It's a great tool for understanding Newman projections for testing. I highly recommend screenshotting this chart. So now that we understand straight chain conformations, let's move on to cyclic conformations. Cyclic conformations are based on different types of ring strains. Angle strain is when bond angles deviate from their ideals by being stretched or compressed. Torsional strain is when cyclic molecules must assume uh, gauche or eclipse interactions forcing stress to occur due to bulky groups being closer to each other. Lastly, non-bonded strain, also known as van der Waal uh, repulsion, is when non-adjacent atoms compete for the same space. This is the dominant source of steric strain in flagpole interactions of the boat conformation. So I'll just label this here.
Speaking of book confirmations, let's get into that really quick. Simple cyclooctanes each have their own unique uh, conformation, with the exception of cyclohexane, which has three. Cyclobutane forms a puckered shape, cyclopentane forms an envelope shape, and cyclohexane has the chair, boat, and twist boat forms. Keep in mind that the chair boat chair form is the most stable uh, form for cyclohexane. So this one right here, most stable. Now I bet you're wondering why do cyclohexanes form these conformations? What's the point? The reason why they all form these uh, formations is to alleviate steric strain. By forming the chair formation, torsion strain, and van der Waals uh, Propulsion along with angle strain is at an all time low. Let's wrap up this section on cyclic conformations by talking about axial and equatorial positions and chair flips. Axial and equatorial positions are easy to understand. Axial groups are perpendicular to the plane, while equatorial groups are parallel. So let's take a look at this chair conformation right here. So we can do a real quick uh, understanding of this. As you can see, all these red groups right here, they're all perpendicular to the plane. So all of these red groups, they will be axial. This is perpendicular, perpendicular, they're all perpendicular, so they're all axial. These, uh, these blue groups right here, they're all perpendicular, or parallel to the plane, sorry. They're all parallel to the plane. So all of these, they will be equatorial. Uh, let me have some room here. A chair flip is a, when a chair conformation is converted to another chair form. During this flip, the chair will go through an intermediate form called the half chair, where all the axial and equatorial groups are flipped. Dashes and wedges will remain the same, however. Chair flips can be slowed down by bulky groups that are attached to the ring. So I'll write here bulky groups. It's important to note that these bulky groups prefer the equatorial position over axial positions in order to lower the non-bonded strain with axial groups. This is how preferred chairs are determined, by the way. On test day, if you see a question asking which chair conformation will be the most preferred, make sure you identify the bulkiest group and see if it's in the equatorial position. We've covered everything we can about conformational isomers, so now let's move on to chirality. When you think of chirality, think of two non-superimposable mirror images. An easier way to think of this is to think of uh, hands. One molecule is the left-hand version, and the other is the right-hand version. Both are technically the same, but they cannot be imposed over each other. Eight chiral molecules, on the other hand, they can be imposed. A common question you're going to see on the MCAT will be one asking for the chiral centers of a molecule. Chiral centers are carbons with asymmetrical cores. So let's take a look at this one right here. So look at this chiral center, and look at this chiral center. Pause the video and tell me if these are R or S uh, carbons. I'll be revealing the answers in three, two, one. All right, so if you uh, watched the previous video we, and you follow the rules that I talked about in the previous video, you can see that we start from here and we work our way around to the next most uh, prioritized group and then the next most prioritized group, we will, will be rotating this way, forming an S carbon right here. Same goes here, we start with the most prioritized one, we rotate around, and we form another S carbon. So when you use, they're both going to be S forms. Whenever you see a carbon with four sub different substituents, an A chiral carbon, think of chirality and think of R and S forms. The last topic we're going to cover in this video is configurational isomers. Configurational isomers are isomers that have a relative position set in their atoms and they cannot be changed with the rotation of bonds. Cleaving and reforming bonds is the only way to change this molecule. There are two different types of configurational isomers, enantiomers and diastereomers. Let's start off with enantiomers. Enantiomers are isomers with non, that are non-superimposable images. They are essentially the chiral molecules that we talked about previously. Enantiomers have identical physical and chemical properties except for one. 
Optical activity. Optical activity is a rotation of plane polarized light by the chiral molecule. Assuming concentration and path lengths are equal, one enantiomer will rotate the same magnitude as the other, but in the opposite direction. Now, dex uh, enantiomers can exist in two forms, dextrorotary and levorotary. Dextrorotary enantiomers rotate clockwise. They are labeled with the plus sign, they're positive, or they can be called with a D sign. Levorotary, on the other hand, rotates in the opposite direction. They'll be rotating counterclockwise. They'll be marked with a negative sign or an else uh, before. The degree of these rotations are dependent on one thing, and that is the number of molecules that are that the light waves encounter. Optical activity depends on two factors, the concentration of the optically active compound and the length of the tube. This relationship can be seen through the use of this equation on the right. Optical activity, which is the rotation of the plane, is the alpha and the alpha observed, which is usually given. Alpha observed will be given or uh, alpha will be given to you on the test day. C is the concentration of the compound and L is the path length. Memorizing the equation isn't necessary in my opinion, but I would try to understand the relationship all the variables share. The last thing I want to cover about enantiomers is racemic mixtures. Racemic mixtures occur when positive enantiomers are equivalent to negative enantiomers. That's because each positive enantiomer matches a negative enantiomer. As a result, the rotations will cancel each other out and there will be no optical activity observed. A question they will ask you on the MCAT is how you can separate racemic mixtures into two isomers. You can do this by adding an enantiomer of another compound to two enantiomers of the same compound. This will form two diastereomers. Separation methods include crystallization, filtration, and distillation, along with several other lab techniques. I'll cover that in a later video. Uh, once separated though, the diastereomers can be reacted together to reform the original enantiomers. Let's end this lecture off with diastereomers. Diastereomers are non-mirror images that have two or more stereogenic centers, and they differ at some but not all of these centers. This, is bas this basically means that they have multiple chiral centers. Remember that a molecule with n chiral centers will have two to the power of n stereoisomers. So for example, if a molecule has two chiral centers, it will have two to the power of two or four stereoisomers. Let's do a quick practice problem now that we know about enantiomers and diastereomers. So I'm going to draw a figure really quick, bear with me, and we can uh, work this problem out. If I leave these empty like these guys, I'm gonna. It's just gonna be a methyl group. I'll label it if it's gonna be like an extended carbon chain. But for now, these are gonna be methyl groups.
All right, so we have four different molecules here. I want you to tell me which ones are enantiomers and which ones are diastereomers. Feel free to pause the video and take your time with this question. I'm going to reveal the answers in three, two, one. Okay, so we can see that compounds one and two are mirror images of each other, and three and four are also mirror images as well. They are all enantiomers of each other. So I'm gonna label these in green as uh, enantiomers. Green means enantiomers, guys, remember that. However, but if you look closely, you can see that one and three are not mirror images of each other. As in three and two and, sorry, uh, one and three are not mirror images of each other, but they are actually having different chiral centers. Because of this, they are not in enantiomers, but they're actually diastereomers. So I'll label diastereomers in a different color. So let's see, what color? Let's see magenta. So one and three, they're diastereomers. The same logic can also be applied to deduce that one and four are diastereomers. Two and three are diastereomers. And two and four are diastereomers. Get familiar with questions like these, guys as recognizing chiral centers and differences between isomers will take you a long way on testing. So let's wrap up by discussing two specific types of diastereomers. Meso compounds are molecules with chiral centers and internal plane of symmetry. You can see on this diagram that there is a uh, but this compound has a horizontal plane of symmetry. So right here, a horizontal plane of symmetry, as opposed to its, uh, as opposed to the left-hand form and the right-hand form. Uh, another thing to note about meso compounds, they're not un uh, optically active. Keep that in mind on test day, guys. The last one that I want to cover with you guys, the last uh, diastereomer I want to cover, is a cis-trans isomer. They're also called geometric isomers, and they're a type of diastereomer that has different substituents around an immovable double bond. So if you see a double bond on an isomer question, think of geometric isomers. Naming these is as simple as adding a cis or trans before the name of the compound, but in more complex compounds, you'll have to rely on easy nomenclature. I covered that in depth in the previous video that I did on isomers, so please refresh yourself with that if you're confused by easy nomenclature. That about covers everything you need to know about isomers for the organic chemistry questions on the MCAT. I hope you all learned something from this series of videos, and if you did, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. I'll be uploading several more videos covering organic chemistry, as well as other topics on the MCAT. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you guys next time.